Okay, so uh, I have been at the AI Summit, and so let me go here. Um, this is a conference from uh, Rework Company, that I think they're an Australian company. So I attended mostly deep reinforcement learning uh, talks. I think I went to a couple of a applied AI summit talks, so, and I took notes throughout. So I'm going to show you the notes. I'm going to go through. If you want to see the schedule, I would go to the deep reinforcement learning one because that's that's the one that I that most of the my notes are about. Um, if you want to follow along, so the first one is secure deep reinforcement learning, um, and I and I took notes about each one of these. And forgive me, I'm going to try and keep chat up. Hey, Deathware, um, thanks for joining. Uh, let me make sure that is this being displayed properly. Yeah, that's good enough, isn't it? Okay. But if you can't see all of my notes, let me know. Um, all right. So the, the first talk. Oh man, this was a whirlwind, by the way. This this has been a long day. <laughs> um, I'm ready to go reward myself with some. Uh, I think I'm going to go with some Pakistani food. Ooh, is that light awful? No, that's not that. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the first talk I went to. It was I went to a bunch of stuff about deep reinforcement learning. I didn't know a ton about deep reinforcement learning. I know conceptually about it. Um, so I learned more today. Uh, so this talk was by a professor at UC Berkeley. It's called Secure Deep, Deep Reinforcement Learning. And she was talking about ways to attack reinforcement learning systems. Like most most re deep reinforcement learning systems aren't even deployed in production today. They're, they're, it's a big research topic. So we're already talking about how to attack them. She talked about three different sort of um, ways you might attack the system. One being integrity, uh, which is try and prevent the system from doing what it's supposed to be doing just from like by like acting with it like doing certain things with it that uh, exploits it and keeps it from doing what it's what it should be doing and then the other is uh, or or to do something the attacker wants hello Jeremy nice to see you um, so the the next one was confidentiality and privacy which I thought was interesting I hadn't quite thought about that before which has a way you can learn sensitive information. And then the third one wasn't really attack, it was just like a statement that like, reinforcement learning is a bad generalization. And she made a couple points about that. Um, so the first example that she talked about with regards to integrity was just talking about the classic adversarial image classification examples. Like she showed the stop sign and how you can place stickers on the stop sign and, and it will misclassify it as some other type of road sign, like a speed limit sign or something like that. And uh, she's saying the same things, those same adversarial attacks can apply to reinforcement learning because um, a lot of these deep reinforcement learning systems are at their core analyzing images or pixels or, or something. So if you can, you can use the same types of, of adversarial uh, image attacks on reinforcement systems you can even, um, and she used some of the game examples, like she had an example of, of a Pong game, and just by adding really small, adver what she called adversarial perturbations, really small perturbations that, that I couldn't even see, right? But there's ways to just change a few, some of the pixels, um, and, and it just locks the system up, um, because, the, because the system is so sensitive to the specific environment of the game. So if you start... If you can add a little bit of noise, a little bit of fuzz, or just add, you know pop up pop up something here or there, just randomly at a certain point, it can really screw up the system, and it'll get locked into a state where it can no longer perform. Um, so I thought that was inter interesting. She called it adversarial perturbation of, of images, and you don't even need to do it to all of the frames if it's a game or, or each of you don't have to have that consistent through the state of the system that it's that it's perceiving. Um, you could just inject it into some of the frames, and that was enough to, to, to lock the agent into a state like that it can't recover from. So I thought that was interesting, and it didn't seem very hard to do. <laughs> so 
So if like if you're deploying a system like this and the public has any control over the state that that the system is observing, that could be problematic. Um, so another really interesting thing was about confidentiality and privacy. So and this reminded she didn't say spoofing, but this is spoofing. So if you if you and, and this reminded me of like how Google autocompletes stuff. Uh, Google.com. So if you say um, um, yesterday, yesterday I went to, there you go, I went to school in Spanish, I, I work in, I went to work in Spanish, I went to the store, or whatever. It's doing all this autocomplete stuff. Um, so there's, there's a model behind this that has tons of information about all the things that people have typed in. If you trained a model on sensitive data, you could say something like, oh, I'm going out on a limb here, but Matt Taylor's Social security number is, and then autocomplete, like make a prediction about what it's going to be. Obviously, Google's not going to do this, but that's an example of a way that you might be able to spoof the system into exposing sensitive information. And um, ways of doing that may not be evident to the people who are designing the system, right? Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, another way to get sensitive information, she gave an example of a reinforcement learning house cleaning robot, you know, that, that knows how to navigate your house, that has learned the environment of your house. Um, so if you take that model that, that that reinforcement learning agent has built about the environment, um, it can infer structure about that environment even when the environment isn't around. So like if you took that model out and you put it into like an empty house and you told it to navigate to the bedroom, it would still go to the bedroom. And so then you'd know where the bedroom was. You know what I mean? So, so that, that was interesting. You don't need the environment to extract information about the environment. Um, she also talked about ways that you can infer the dynamics of the system, like the friction coefficients of the flooring, for example. So she seems. So it seems like you're able to not only understand the layout of the environment, but also some of the, the, the dynamics of the environment. So she could infer whether it was carpeted or uh, wood floors or, or laminate tile or something like that. So that was kind of interesting too. Um, her comments about generalization were. Um, basically stating that deep reinforcement learning overfits and it's brittle to minor environment changes. So it's not, it doesn't generalize very well. Um, and it seems to be a theme in this conference that this is well understood by researchers and they are trying to create benchmarks to identify these insufficiencies and to define some type of evaluation metrics um, uh, to, you know, benchmark, to, to, to uh, help benchmark generalization capabilities. Because these systems aren't good at generalization. There's a lot, there's a theme of generalization that you'll see. Um, so, and, and I, I don't quite, I don't quite remember exactly what she's talking about this, but by evaluation metrics, for example, if you train on a default environment and you can test on that environment, and then you can interpolate, you, maybe you want to train on some random environment and test on a random environment, great. But you can't train on a default environment and test on another environment that, that doesn't transfer easily. Now, they're working on methods to do this, but it's all tricks and hacks. Um, now, the, the E is for extreme environments, so, and that they're just really bad on. Um, so uh, so this, these models don't transfer over from environment to environment, which, you know, I sort of knew. Um, my takeaway was nothing is good at this yet. Like none of the there's none of these deep reinforcement learning systems are good at generalization, and that's just the way it is. <laughs> um, I also made a note. There's something called OpenAI Retro where they they were running it on like Sonic the Hedgehog or something that I wanted to investigate because even that wasn't good at generalizing. Um, okay, so I'm going on to the next talk. There's a lot of talks today. I can't remember how many. They're all very short. You know, this one was. 25 minutes, I think they're all something around 25 minutes. Um, okay, this is by Jacob Andreas from uh, Microsoft, and I think he also had an associate with MIT. This was about NLP, but it's called Learning to Act by Learning to Describe. 
and it's sort of like NLP plus reinforcement learning applications. And from what I could tell, this was just sort of showing different hacky hacks of like how how you can use reinforcement learning to help understand language. He does. They do have one, one thing I took away was you can create these different models: a model for a speaker and a model for a listener. And these could have these could be both different agents. You know, one that's generating text and one that's listening for text and then trying to respond with text. Um, and it, one of the themes was trying to treat language as some form of gameplay. Um, so training the model listener to classify and use that listener model as a reward function for the speaker model. Sort of interesting. Uh, the takeaway there was a, uh, think of language as some sort of game theory. The next question was what can language do for NLP? I don't know. I didn't get much out of that, so I just probably put not much. <laughs> Um, okay, on to the next one. This was 10.05. So this was a guy from Google Brain called Rewards, Resets, Exploration, Bottlenecks for Scaling Deep RL and Robotics. Um, so there's another theme in, in several of the reinforcement learning talks was diversity. Uh, diversity seems to be really important to reinforcement learning agents. Um, and that sort of like diversity between, tra between agents when you're training. And uh, this this guy sort of, sort of stated that like diversity is what's going to lead us to AGI, which I don't think is the case. Um, but diversity is certainly important, I think. Um, so uh, like the learning of diverse skills, you, you can't just learn how to train an agent to do one thing. You, you need to have the ability to perform more than one type of action, more than one type of skill in context, in the correct context as you're uh, as you're acting in environments. Um, uh, I, think, I don't know why I put these in quotes. This is something he was, he was comparing these two things that he called real world learning versus sim to real. I don't know anything about sim to real, so. Uh, but, but he definitely did need to define a lot of different diverse task definitions. So this diversity sort of has to be hand coded into the system. There's a lot of stuff that has to be hand coded into these systems. <clears throat> There's, like I said, it's not generalizable. Um, so a lot of this effort is trying to minimal, minimize the effort, the human effort, to, to teach these these skills to bots. Where's my? Uh, hold, where's my mouse? Is it five? Option five. Control five. There it is. Okay. Um, minimize human effort to teach skills to the robots. Um, uh, one interesting thing was you talked about reset free learning was analogous to continuous learning. Oh, I don't know, that's not really the way I define it. When, when they talk about resets in, the, in, in RL, it's like you've got a little agent, you do do, he's walking through the environment and he gets caught up and like falls in a hole and it's just stuck, right? You're just stuck in the hole and, and what do you do? Um, you reset, like you have to basically abandon your state and reset to an initial state so you can continue. Um, and this wasn't, it, when you reset like this, it's not continuous learning, right? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, thanks for, I can fix that. I can fix that. How's that, is that better? I should have, uh, all right. I fixed it before you guys even noticed. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so. This reset free learning, they're saying it was continuous learning, but it didn't seem like continuous learning to me, at least not like what I would say is online learning. Because some people call continuous learning the same as online learning. Um, you still, the, the reinforcement, none of these reinforcement learning systems were necessarily online. It wasn't, the models had to be retrained over, you know, over and over. New environment, new, new features of the environment, retrain, train, train. And it's a massive amount of training, you know, to get to a point where you have a model that can, can, can run through a, a test environment again. Um, but there was some effort to try and, and mitigate these resets. And this was mentioned in a couple of the presentations. Um, exploration was defined as a robot moving objects and getting some updated image caption. Uh, it's not the way I did define exploration because I feel when, when I talk about exploration, I talk about, I, I think about um, online learning. Because to explore, um, 
and, and when they talk about exploration, they're talking about training a system to explore, um, not not like it, it inherently exploring and updating its model immediately. None of these things update their model immediately uh, w when they when they explore. It's all like a policy. It's all it's all some the policy has like exploration baked into it because it was trained to do so. Um, I didn't quite understand this. There was this. There was a paper about this leave no trace thing. Uh, I'm trying to get the. You think of online learning as learning while also outputting. Uh, yeah. So, th so they're online. Yeah. That, that, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, while continuous learning can be an offline system that's only learning but not outputting anything yet. Um, that could be. All of these reinforcement learning systems are outputting. Like they're taking actions. They're moving through an environment. I would say that they're. The, I went to all these deep reinforcement learning talks because, because I'm interested in the movement aspect of, of them because they have this loop where you take an action and then the state changes, right? You take an action and the environment changes. So that is um, familiar to me because that's, you know, the, the brain does the same thing. It takes an action and then, and then the sensory input is updated. When you move, you see yourself move, you see the environment change. Um, so I like that sort of uh, similarity to HTM. So, um, okay, so the leave no trace thing I didn't quite get, but if you know what a Q function is in, in reinforcement learning or like Q learning, it's like this huge Q, Q as in like a big buffer or something of all of, all of the previous states and act actions and states that you've had. So you can sort of look up the best the best thing, it's, it's a cheat, honestly, it feels like a hack to me, the whole Q function thing is a hack. Um, but they're using a Q function to learn probability of a bad state and then go back to initial state. I think that was a way to avoid these uh, resets, right? So, so before you get to a place where you need to reset, where resetting would be um, expensive in a way because you'd have to you know, cut, clear, cut off your progress and go back to an initial state, like recognizing a bad state and then backtracking somehow. I didn't, I didn't quite understand that, honestly. But, um, so I did take away that it's difficult. This idea of exploration is, in, is difficult. Uh, they, I think they talked about this word empowerment, which I think was just a term they used in one of their papers, which is like the ability to predictably change the future state of the world, like uh, t take an action that changes the state of the world and know that when you do something, you're going to change the world. And, they, and this seems like some sort of an aspect of a policy that adds exploration to it. If you're empowered, you, it's sort of an ex, a way to explore uh, the state space. Um, the summary talked about rewards, resets, and exploration. Uh, okay, next talk. Um, so this was a a deep dive, this was an introduction to deep reinforcement learning, which I thought I could use. So this is sort of just the basics of reinforcement learning by uh, Joshua, I don't know how to say his last name, at OpenAI. Um, so this is just probably some basic stuff that I'll go over, that because uh, I'm still learning about this stuff too. Um, reinforcement learning is useful when evaluating behaviors is g easier than generating them. So. Reinforcement learning, it seems like the trend is you have an action space, right? You're, you have to define that action space ahead of time for whatever task, whatever it is you want your agent to do in whatever environment it is, you have to define this action space somehow. You, you're not, it doesn't automatically generate new actions. It's, you have a space of actions that you can take. Um, now, this can be a very large action space, but that really increases the amount of computation that's necessary. Um, so, uh, but, but none of this stuff is generating actions. You're not creating ways to, new ways to interact with the environment. You're, you're, you, are, you have like a library of actions that uh, you're selecting, right? Um, a policy, you know, it's a, a reinforcement learning policy, which they denote as pi in all of the equations, um, is, uh, uh, I, I honestly don't, like, I sort of know what it is in my head, but I don't, I, I don't know it well enough to define it well. <laughs> um, but it's, but it's, um, I would just have to Google it, uh, honestly. Um, okay, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to decode some of the terms they were using. When they say, say stochastic, 
They mean that it's a probably probability distribution of actions that you get returned that you select from versus a deterministic system or deterministic agent where the policy maps to an action. So I think the, the policy is like, given the state, uh, what action am I going to take? And so you can have a stochastic policy that gives you a probability distribution of actions that you, that you might want to take and a deterministic one. Um, there's also a term they use called trajectory, um, which is a sequence of states and actions, um, which is, I think, you know, what gets stored in the queue, uh, in, in, the, in queue learning. Um, but uh, they, they call this thing a trajectory, which is just like a, just a sequence of states, like in order. Um, and they also call it an episode or a rollout. Um, these are all new terms for me. Uh, the reward function I, I generally knew it's like uh, it's basically uh, it's a function you run to give you how good is your state are your state action pairs and uh, this can be for like right now it can be for this action or it can sort of be a measure of cumulative reward which they call a return um, okay so in reinforcement learning we want a policy that maximizes the expected return um, so your act you, you want your reward to be high essentially a value function will tell you something about that expected return after a state or a state action pair. So how how valuable was that? Uh, it wasn't totally. I didn't totally understand that. I like this um, uh, this this graph here. It's sort of. I know it's not um, super easy to see, but which is the here we go. So breaking up the reinforcement algorithms into model-free and model-based reinforcement learning. Here's Q learning, which I talked about. A lot of the interesting things it seems is happening in this deep deep Q or DQNs or deep Q learning networks. Um, and then there's all of these other things. A lot of them they, they called PPOs. That was a really I don't know even know what that stands for. Something about policy, I'm sure. Optimization, some type of policy optimization. Um, and then the model-based stuff. Well, they didn't talk nearly as much about. Uh, I don't. I think that's harder. It seemed to me like the model-based stuff was harder to figure out. Uh, uh, so most of the work it seems to be is in model-free reinforcement learning. But essentially, you've got this cycle. You 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 run the policy, you evaluate the policy, and then you improve the policy and rinse and repeat over and over and over again. That's sort of the the gist of reinforcement learning. The value function is an approximation. Uh, value function is actually some other neural network, and it gives you a, uh, some approximate value for your actions, I guess. <laughs> um, so this is a, a direct quote from Joshua. Learning models is a really hard problem. And I like to point that out because that's where I think the big opportunity is for HTM and with association with reinforcement learning is how can we use HTM models along with reinforcement learning? Because I think we have a good mechanism for creating models as, as sensory motor integration evolves and we and we have a way to generate movements or to at least be, have some cause causality in, in the movement space. And this is the, one of the problems because reinforcement learning isn't good at generating Movements you have to have like this action space, so I don't I don't know how to how to resolve this, but um, so that's one one takeaway. I didn't know that was the case. You need to predefine your action space, and with HTM, uh, I think we might be able to help with that if we have a predefined action space and we can contribute to somehow we can have get a hook into that value function or the policy or something so that we can contribute to that action. De that policy to decide what action it's going to take so that the model can then update based on whatever happened. Um, maybe that's an opportunity for us. Uh, also, reward function design is apparently very hard. And a big takeaway is that this stuff is re still really new. I mean, this guy's from OpenAI, and he's saying that most of these deep reinforcement learning implementations, first of all, there's not very many of them, and they're all tuned for research. So if you're going to try and deploy any of this stuff in production, like you're basically, it's a gre it's you're on your own. You're, you're probably going to need to put a lot of research into it and, and figure out some hard problems yourself. Um, also, tuning the hyperparameters is also very hard. Uh, so that was, those are my takeaways from that talk. Uh, okay. 
Um, this is from Google Brain. A lot of Google representation in Google Brain. There is a deep mind. There was uh, so learning abstractions with hierarchical reinforcement learning. Uh, this was sort of interesting. Um, now, what they mean by hierarchy is that, say, you have an agent and it's got legs. You know, so first of all, the reinforcement learning action space for that agent's locomotion involves things like move this joint 30 degrees out or move this other joint 20 degrees in. You know, that, that's the sort of action space granularity we're talking about and the lower level of the hierarchy. Now they're talking about another hierarchical level that's more concerned with navigation through a bigger space. So say you have a maze and you know you need to get from point A around some obstacles to point B. First of all, you've got to deal with locomotion. That's sort of the lower level um, parts of the hierarchy. And the high level means like, okay, well, I need to move right. You know, then I need to move up and then I need to move left, right? Um, so that's what they're talking about when they're talking about hierarchy, uh, high level versus low level. Um, so some of the things I noted was that these high level, this high level, um, excuse me, high, high level part of it operates at a lower frequency, so it's easier to learn in this space, um, and exploration is easier because you don't have to worry about the details of locomotion if you just uh, off, you know, talk about, you, you put that off to the lower level of the hierarchy. Um, Intrepid Fox, as I understand it, the reinforcement learning predefined rewards and action spaces has always been the biggest problem. Uh, the space has become infinitely large, and we're trying to hard code this stuff essentially trying to account for anything and everything that could happen ahead of time. Yeah, and you can't do that, right? I mean, your environment is going to change in ways that you will not anticipate, and, and I, think we, I think we understand that. Um, okay, so, so one of the things he said that I didn't agree with was, he said, we humans don't explore by just flailing, you know, and he's talking about having a sort of a high-level policy that, that does navigation versus the low-level policy, but that's not quite true. Like we learn how to explore by flailing. If you babies flail, and that's how they learn how their limbs locomote, you know, move through space. So, um, so there there were a few quotes about the brain and, and analogies to human development and stuff that were were a little bit off. I would say uh, versed on, on how I think about the brain. Um, high level abstractions must be created. Uh, so, so this is, you know, so you have to hard code this stuff. It's not, it doesn't just learn high level abstractions. Uh, Jeremy says, ha ha, should sound, he should hear me trying to learn a Bach prelude. <laughs> yeah, definitely some flailing. And he, and it's true, you know, you do flail. You do flail. When I'm learning a gu the guitar, one of the things that they tell you to do is meander. And, and meandering is just exploring. It's just like, what happens if I do this? You know, because you learn when you do that. You learn. That, that's sort of the flail. Like, I don't know what's going to sound good until I try it. Right? I'm failing trying to code my first proper machine learning implementation. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so the big decision in designing a system with a high-level abstraction is what are the abstractions? If you're talking about navigation through a maze, you, you might decide move right, move left, or just northeast, south, turn, some, stuff like that could be the abstractions, and then the low level is just the locomotion required to execute that movement, you know, that high level movement. But every system is going to be different. If you're if you're modeling a hand or, or something that with a completely different navigation system, you might have totally different high level abstractions. Like for example, open and close your grip or and for a hand there's a there's like a huge array of different grips that you can do with your hand. Um, you can look it up, like Google, Google hand grips, there's a ton of them. Um, and that's just from, you know, um, inspecting humans and, and how they operate with different tools. There's a, there's a lot of different grips you might use. Um, so all those high-level abstractions have to be hand-coded, essentially, for, for whatever system you're creating. Um, Goal-conditioned uh, hierarchical reinforcement learning. Um, I don't remember writing this. Low-level goals just need to figure out how to accomplish high-level steps. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't remember why I wrote that. Um, 
so I think some of the some of the open questions is how how do we learn efficiently? Um, we they they're saying that these high level policies must be modular, like move left. It must be something that you can apply wherever you're at in the space. It can't be dependent upon some some state. I think. Um, so the hierarchical or the high level training depends on the ability of the low level policy. So there, you can't you can't have high level goals that the low level policies can't achieve. For example, like if you want to move up some stairs, the low, the there has to be a low level policy that knows how to climb stairs, right? Um, high level training must be on policy. So I'm still trying to understand this idea of on policy versus off policy. I wrote a definition of it later, so we'll get to that. And so I'm not going to go into that right now, but you can't go off policy for the high level training because it's too inefficient and it's unfeasible in, in the real world. Um, and they did, he did say a little bit about off policy corrections, but it just seemed really hacky to me. So I just said it was a hack. <laughs> um, all right. So next up is, is Jeff Kloon. Uh, Jeff Kloon works for Uber AI labs. Uh, and he talked about something called poet, which, um, it's hard to explain. He's got a whole really long presentation at ICML 2019 online. You can go look up that talks about map elites and, and poet, but this is basically all about goal switching. And this seems really inspired. This is, this is all about diversity. Once again, um, it calls it quality diversity, QD algorithms. And, and these really have like an evolutionary flavor to me. Um, but the, but it seems like what it is is a way of jumping around some space of solutions, like not just looking looking at, at one specific area, but being able to jump from from one from the from one location in the search space of solutions to another location. And this this is not this did not seem very brain based to me, but it was more about like the evolution of um, organisms of uh, or of cultures even. Um, so he, he relates this, he used a term called adaptive radiations. Like for example, there's different types of fish in different ponds in Africa and they all have adapted specifically for their own environments, but they all came from a common ancestor, you know? Um, so like, uh, but they, but they've all become very efficient in those, in their different areas. Uh, the, com the computer was another example that he used of adaptive radiations. You know, we start with one basic type not basic, but like very specific types of computers. But now there's all different types of computers doing specific things. Um, excuse me. He talked about some paper, some something called Go Explore, that solved Montezuma's Revenge, which is a really, and, and they use this idea of um, quality diversity algorithms. Um, these are all open-ended algorithms, meaning that they will continue to improve as long as they have more things to train on. Um, when we talk about alpha star, that's also, we'll talk about open-ended algorithms as well. Um, so this POET, what was POET? What did it stand for? I forgot. Paired Open-Ended Trailblazer. Uh, so this is some framework that he and some colleagues created that periodically generates new environments. And then it optimizes on, it optimizes on one environment and then will like systematically generate new environments. And I don't think these are completely generated from scratch. Like there's some hard coding in there. Um, and then it will transfer its learning. So it'll actually transfer weights from what it learned in one environment to the next environment. So taking with it, like here's, here's an example to use. Like you've got a little agent. He's walking, he's learned to walk across a flat space. Okay. So let's take that, transfer it to a new environment. The new environment's got flat space, but it's also got these little stumps. So the so the um, the agent now knows how to how to navigate through flat space, but now it's got to learn more about the stump. So so it's it's sort of a way to separate learning about different aspects of different environments. You might have another environment that's that's got rocky terrain, another one that's got pitfalls or things you don't want to fall into, and so you learn all about one environment, and that's sort of the idea. Whoops, the idea behind this. You learn all about one environment, you transfer it to another, you learn about that one, you transfer it to another, and then you can jump sort of back and forth and, and try different environments and try and take these 
these this knowledge transfer and you do this like all in parallel and and try and find like the sweet spots in the search space for your agent um so that was interesting he had a lot of good graphics you should try uh look it up look up jeff clune map elites or poet and there's he's got talks online about it, like long talks <laughs> he only gave a 25 minute talk so i didn't get much okay um another google brain talk Understanding how value predictions shape deep representations. Um, so this was something about dis, 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 uh, distributional reinforcement learning and auxiliary tasks. Um, I did not understand this talk. So <laughs> I tried. I, I don't understand these drawings that I made. I was just trying to follow them. I did not understand what this, what this was all about. So um, fail, big fail. This was interesting just because it's StarCraft. You know, I like StarCraft. Um, so uh, from DeepMind, AlphaStar, which is mastering the real-time strategy game StarCraft II. Um, so some of the challenges that they said about this is, in StarCraft, this is a complicated game. So, I mean, this is impressive. This is really impressive. Um, there's hidden information in StarCraft because you only get to see what's around your troops. The rest of the map is clouded. And you, o you only see the map as you move things through it and you explore. And there's this huge action space. So they've defined 10 to the 8th ac action space. <laughs> um, so you can do so many things. Um, so here's sort of the architecture. If you're interested in the Alpha Star architecture, uh, we've got uh, the core of it is a deep LSTM system. But they've got all these other deep networks, maybe not deep, but at least neural networks. There's a ResNet here, there's a feedforward net, and then transformers. And so this is so that so those are this is highly tuned to StarCraft, by the way. So like this is this would not be easy to transfer to any other game, even something like Warcraft or even maybe StarCraft One. I don't think you'd be I'm sure you wouldn't be able to transfer it. But they have these ideas of um, spatial observations, economy observations, because you're always building things and you've got materials that you're trying to optimize, units that you're building. Um, but at the core of it is a deep LSTM system. And, and, and what comes out of that is move or attack or mine, you know, things like that. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, so... What they did is they train, again, diversity is important in this. They, they created this thing called Alpha Star League. And so they'd start with human game definitions, right, um, that they got from Blizzard. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get to that. I, the action space, I don't know how they define it, but it's totally hard-coded for StarCraft II. Um, so it would be like, uh, given... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because you can you can select any unit and move them to any place or to give them a, an action in any spatial location. I have no idea, but it's but I guarantee you it's highly tuned to StarCraft. <laughs> um, so the way they started training these, and this is a massive amount of training. Uh, they obviously, if you don't know this, you know Alpha Star beat the best StarCraft two gamers in the world over and over and over again, ten times out of ten. <clears throat> so it was a big win for AI. Um, but they started by getting human replays from Blizzard. So Blizzard had some uh, information about uh, humans playing the game. And so they initially trained on humans playing the game. And that's how they got sort of their seed for, uh, for Alpha Star to, to play on. And once they got some agents that were trained on human plays, then they would start, then they would create new agents and they would train them to beat those agents, right? And then they'd create diverse representations of those agents, and every agent they make, the goal would be to beat all the previous agents. So it was a ton of agents, and they would encourage diversity, which they said was crucial. They had to do this. If they didn't encourage diversity, I don't think it would have worked. Um, so the way they did this was um, they would give the different agents slightly different goals, okay? so. So, like, for one agent, its goal, it would be rewarded for beating all of the other agents in the league. For some of the agents, they would reward it just for beating one or another, like, particular agent. Because it would develop specific strategies just to beat that one agent. It wouldn't attempt to generalize its strategy across the whole space of agents. 
Um, and that would inject some diversity into the training environment. Um, they would also reward some of their agents for building different types of units. So they would, they would hard code some reward and make some that um, would, would get more reward throughout the game for, for building particular types of units or mining particular types of resources and stuff like that. So again, hard coding things for sure. Um, I do not know what the Nash strategy is. I tried to follow that, but I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> but it's some type of probability distribution over all of the agents that's optimal. The interesting thing is to beat, for Alpha Star to beat these human grandmasters, they trained over 600 agents, right? From that, in that scheme of, of everyone has to beat all the other agents and then they create a new version of it and it has to beat the other agents. Each one of these agents went through more than a thousand years of in-game training. That's 600,000 years of training. <laughs> Which blows my mind, you know? How much compute power is that? That's crazy. It, but that's what it took to beat these two grand, these grandmasters. That's what it takes to reach human level capability in StarCraft II. 600,000 years of, of, of playing against yourself. And AlphaGo is the same way. A massive amount of training um, to get these, and we were talking about these statistical probabilities, because all of this is just probabilities and, and uh, trying to learn these probabilities by seeing so many different examples of things. Um, Okay, so it, they, each one of these agents iteratively learned from beating all the previous versions. And so this was sort of interesting. As they watched the evolution of these agents, they saw that initially the agents would, would expand their bases, and that would win for a little bit. But then the next sort of generation of agents some would be more aggressive because they'd learn that being aggressive, you could take over all those bases. So being aggressive was then rewarded, right? So then the next generation of agents were rewarded for being defensive because they were being attacked all the time. So, so you go through sort of these evolutions of strategies and to the end where they're, um, you know, at, at some point after you've developed, you're, you're, you're getting defensive, you realize, well, now I need to go scout and see where I'm going to be attacked from and by what. So there's sort of this evolution of strategy over time as these agents are constantly fighting each other um, and trying to come to the best solution. But some interesting thing is, uh, things is that Alpha Star did things that were really interesting to the players that it was playing. Like it would hide units. It would, it would put a unit close to an enemy base, but just out of like eye uh, reach so it couldn't see that it was there. Um, and that was surprising to one of the Grandmasters. And it also it learned how to scout basically by evolving from just expanding bases to being more aggressive and attacking to then being more defensive and then realizing well I have I have to go scout if I'm, if that's is, that's more rewarding to to scout. Um, so the big takeaway from this was you should encourage diversity in your reinforcement learning agents by allowing them to have different goals. Whew, okay, it's a long day. Um, Okay, into the afternoon. <laughs> uh, injecting structure. This was an NVIDIA talk. Injecting structure for generalization. Again, generalization. And robot manipulation. Um, so this guy, gave, uh, his examples, he gave like a video. of. You remember Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons? If you're my age, you probably do. Um, but it was a house cleaning robot, basically, with attitude. She had a lot of attitude, but Sam's attitude... Um, he, he wants to build robots that are able to um, basically do lots of different things in unstructured environments. Um, how to, so the big, the big question is how do we generalize in all these unstructured environments? Um, I'm not sure I took a lot from this. This is a weird, I took some weird notes because I, I was planning on talking about control because he, he had this slide where he went to control to planning to perception, but then that didn't go anywhere. So, so I just made notes about <laughs> uh, visual motor skills, diversity of skills. Can we build representations that can transfer to similar tasks or questions he's asking? Um, he's talking about sensor fusion. 
and, and the need for it to create a general representation. Uh, sensor fusion meaning you might have um, torque information from a robot arm, you might have a camera information. Um, and uh, one of the nice things that it's, this adds some robustness because then you can interfere with the camera and it can still do some things because it has has other inform other sensory information coming in. Um, they always seem to start, not always, but he uh, he mentioned that starting with some random policy, um, representation transfers between tra tasks. That's a challenge. I mean, they, they really haven't. Nobody's really uh, solved this yet. What you want to be able to do is learn from when you're vacuuming and, and how those actions can be applied to other tasks, other goals that you have. Uh, but and, and currently all these policies need to be relearned when you're, when you're jumping between tasks. Uh, Model-based task space control. I didn't know what that meant, so I wrote it down. <laughs> the main takeaway from this for me was action representations and self-supervision self provide structure. And, and he had more on that slide, but he switched so fast I couldn't write it down. This guy went really fast through his slides, so it was it was hard for me to take in the whole thing. Um, hello, Mark Brown. Uh, I, I'm probably I'm more than halfway through my recap of my my conference day. I learned a lot about reinforcement learning, and and boy are my arms tired. Uh, quantifying generalization in deep reinforcement learning. Again, generalization. This is an open AI talk. Um, lots of talk about generalization. There's, it's a big problem in, in reinforcement learning, and nobody's got good solutions for it. <laughs> um, they're, they're all admitting, like, we need better benchmarks for generalization. We need to figure out how to, how to, how to do generalization. Um, this uh, open AI has some system, or has some platform called CoinRun, which is a game platform. And what it does is generates an infinite amount of levels for training, which is uh, which is beneficial because it because uh, you can help train generalizing. You can help to, to it gives you an environment where you're forced to generalize, right? Um, sort of. <laughs> uh, but unlike Sonic, I mean, because that uh, when they did the Sonic the Hedgehog thing at OpenAI, they only had like 50 levels, so you can only do so much with 50 levels. Um, uh, Red Fox says, relearning for different tasks, a common theme. Yeah, uh, deep learning is doing incredible things, but we're not really any closer to AGI. I agree. I agree. Um, okay, large training sets are better, obviously, for deep learning. Large training sets are better. Deep architectures are generalized better. Yeah, file that under duh. <laughs> um, agents can overfit to a large number of specific environments. So I, I did nothing um, mind-blowing out of this talk. Uh, okay, okay. Here we go into off policy versus on policy. So here's where I wrote down. I don't quite understand on policy versus off policy yet. I'm going to need a night's sleep on it, I think. So this is called off policy reinforcement learning for real world robots from Google Brain. Um, on policy means you can only train on data from your one agent, from one agent, your current agent. And that data is not reusable for new environments. So that I think that means that policy is tied to an environment and an agent. So when they say off policy, they're talking. I think they're talking about learning transfers, something like that. But but you can train one agent on another agent's experience, um, and possibly combine data from multiple agents' experience into another policy. So it lets you run, or it lets us train um, reinforcement learning models without robots in the training loop. Um, this guy and Google Brain, they've got this thing, what they call it, um, the arm farm. <laughs> they called it the arm farm at Google, and it's just like a bunch of robot arms. I saw this in a couple different presentations, where there's just a bunch of ar robot arms, and they're all like just reaching and grasping things. You know, all they're basically all training, and they're and they're all collecting this data so that they can create reinforcement learning policies off of it. And if you do this off policy thing, it lets you train these reinforcement learning models without having robots in the training loop, which is great because robots in the training loop are expensive. Um, so on policy is good for specific environments like Amazon warehouse. I, I guess as long as the environment doesn't change, it's uh, as long as the agent doesn't change and the environment doesn't change. 
Uh, there's a lot of a lot of talk about Q learning. Um, this this guy talked about a specific type of Q learning called QT Ops, which is was so they were using on so they would they would train they would have an off policy system, but they would use on policy to fine tune things, and that would get their accuracy from like 85% to like 95% or something. So they would they would only use a few robots. They need much less robots essentially to train a reinforcement learning system to do something. Um, so this seems like optimizations, the whole on policy versus off policy thing. Improving QT ops to use less real robot data, uh, using a simulation and trying to transfer that learning into the real world. Um, so the difficulty in off policy evaluation is that old agent behavior does not equal current agent behavior. That was my takeaway. Does anybody remember Zork? <laughs> Bit King, I'm looking at you. Uh, so this was about reinforcement learning in interactive fiction games. So I thought it was interesting because I used to play, there was a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy text-based game. That was my first experience with text-based games with, with uh, and I, I thought it was really fun. So this, he talked about Zork, um, which is an entirely text-based control and state sort of game. <laughs> yeah. But it's like basically the game is a text thing and it says, you wake up in a field, there's a white house to the west, and there's a mailbox in front of you. And then it's just like a, got a cursor and then you have to type something like open mailbox or move west or, you know, sleep or something like that, right? <laughs> um, nothing happens, you yeah. know. Uh, so um, the idea, the motivation behind this, one of them anyway, is, is to better process voice commands because typically you can only give like one command at a time and, and these text-based processing systems are, are really brittle. Like you can't say, do this, you can't give it a complicated sentence and expect it to understand it. Um, current voice assistants are not reinforcement learning. That was one thing he said. So when you're talking to Alexa or Siri or whatever, that's not reinforcement learning. That's just deep, deep neural networks um, because apparently they're too costly to train and they still need to study how they work. Uh, hello, hello, Maverick watching Spider-Man movie ads. <laughs> Sorry, I don't subscribe and you won't have to. <laughs> um, chop down door never worked. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. You played the you played the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. That was great. That was my first, that was a really intriguing game because I played that game before I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because I was really young, and so it was even more intriguing because I did not know the storyline or anything. Uh, is the no the mic's not turned off? You guys can all hear me, right? Yeah, I, I don't, the mic's not turned off. I don't know what's going on with your uh, with your audio. Okay, um, so. So when you're dealing with text, one of the things is it's a huge action space because when you are dealing with like a game like Pong or whatever, Atari games or whatever, or even PlayStation, you have, you have buttons and there's only certain combinations. There's a, there's a very finite combination of buttons and actions that you can take with that, keyboard, uh, with that button pad, uh, the keypad. But when you're dealing with text, it's a huge action space because you're entering phrases not buttons. So that's one of the big challenges with reinforcement learning when you're dealing with text. Uh, I don't know why the heck you can't hear, but it doesn't matter because you can't hear me say that. So um, let's see. Must return a history of, must retain a history of states. Uh, that's one of the things like restrictions. So he had this general game playing agent that he constructed at Microsoft called Nail, if you want to look it up. It doesn't perform very well on any one game, but it performs decent, like novice level across 20 different text-based games. So that was interesting, right? <clears throat> okay, there's, he, he also described a couple of other algorithms aside from that that were text-based. A star search which uh, which is has the most handicap handicap being you're giving it a lot of a priori information like all of its actions were predefined specifically for Zork right so in order to get and this did really well because it was finely tuned to Zork not generalizable at all and it also had this ability to travel through time which means 
which is like a replay, you know. Uh, if you get to a point where you fail at the game or you die, you can just step back, step back, step back, and then retry, right? So, so that this has a, a the ability to do something like that it baked into the system. Um, the next thing, and I heard this idea of this actor critic model in reinforcement learning. I don't know what it is, but they call this A two C or advantage actor critic. Uh, single policy, but multiple parallel environments, right? So you're running a bunch at the same time using the same policy. Again, it has a fixed action set. Um, so this was, again, specifically tuned towards each game, um, but there's no time travel. Now, the nail was, was his thing. I think it's open source. I think you can look it up. Microsoft, search for Microsoft nail. Navigate, acquire, interact, learn. So first of all, there's lots of hand coding of things, and there's hard coded external memory, but it's but it's focused on text based games, so you can play 20 different text games on it. So it's not locked into Zork; it's just locked into text based games, and it performs pretty poorly across all the games, but it can at least perform on the games. Uh, okay, next talk. The hidden risk of blind AI, uh, blind trust in AI's black box. I talked to this guy, Ajay. Um, I didn't really get anything from his from his talk. He just talked about um, what they call explainable AI. Um, nothing too interesting there. Um, I, I talked to him about what we do in Amenta because he talked about things about the brain, and he was super interested in what we do. But uh, I didn't get much from his talk. Um, okay. What are checkpoints of game? Uh, check, checkpoints meaning like time travel, meaning that you can a checkpoint. Any any action you take is a checkpoint, and you can go back to that state and and try again. You know, like think choose your own adventure. Every time you die, you're just like, well, I'll go back to the page I was before <laughs> and try something new. Uh, yeah, what what Mark said. Um, Okay, so from word embeddings to pre-trained models, this is a talk from Amazon. Uh, this was just sort of a, a recap of recent history of NLP developments. Um, word embeddings, we talked about word, devet, glove, fast, text. Um, I mean, just look up word embeddings and these technologies. Uh, one thing I noted was she talked about this thing called Elmo, which was, uh, and she referenced a blog post by Mihail Eric, who used to be an intern at Nementa. Uh, but he currently works for Amazon and um, uh, for Alexa. And there's this other thing that I called BERT that I guess Google has created, bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. It's another type of uh, language processing NLP type of thing. I don't, I didn't, I don't know much about it. She didn't go too far into it, but I saw oh, someone else talk about it. Um, one of the vendors was talking about how they could use BERT. But it's it's based on word vectors. It's basically word vectors that because word vectors, word embeddings, excuse me, they don't give you good context of words. So like when you say I eat an apple or I use an apple computer, it 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 encodes those word embeddings the same way. But BERT apparently has different embeddings for different contexts. <laughs> Sorry, man. Alexa, destroy Mark Brown. <laughs> Did it work? We'll never know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll stop. I'll stop. Uh, that's it. That's it. That was the end of... Okay, so so a few, a little recap. Let me turn this to... Uh, there we go. Now you can look out my screen. Sorry, I'm not sure, of course. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean, Hal. Wait, wait, wait. I don't know if this is going to work. Oh, I don't have that... Uh, Sounds that work? There, I thought there was one that says, sorry, Dave. That's right. Sorry, Dave. Oh, you're not going to hear it. I don't have it set up on my laptop. Anyway, <laughs> 100,000 copies of all intelligence. Good idea. Um, okay, so the the talks were informative. I think I, know, I understand more about reinforcement learning now, which is great. Um, so I feel more informed. It was an exhausting day, honestly. Um, I got up at like 5 a.m. and drove up to San Francisco. Um, the, uh, the conversations I had were interesting because 
anybody that I talk to, and, and I probably talk to, oh, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe ten, ten, twelve different people, like in depth about what we do at Nementa and and how the brain is the way towards AGI and how important it is to understand the brain. None of this stuff that I saw today was is truly like brain inspired in the way that we talk about being brain inspired. Um, and when I did talk to people about what we do here, people were excited about it. They wanted to know more information. I probably gave out 20 different um, business cards. Uh, so that's good. That's good. I mean, I think people realize that um, perhaps this is something we should be paying attention to. Am I still streaming? Because it looks like, it looks like a, oh, fudge. Nope. Stream died. Can't tell. It's, I, I think this stream died. Crud. No, I'm still on. Okay. <laughs> I, I, it's hotel Wi-Fi, guys. Hotel Wi-Fi. Sorry. Um, so uh, anyway, I talked to a lot of people, and and when I start talking about how we think the brain works and how how we think movement is so important and and how we need to build up sensory models, uh, sensory motor models of reality, and 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 it, it's a totally different sort of language than everybody else is talking about, and and the people I talked to were excited about that. Um, because I think a lot of people realize that deep learning isn't going to lead to AGI. In fact, I took a I took a picture. Oh, where did it go? I took a picture that you'll like. Uh, let's see. Let me go to my photos. They had these little these little things sort of stuck around, and and. Uh, so here's here's an example of it. I don't know if you can see that. Will AGI ever be reached? And you've got these stickers. Why did it do that? <laughs> and you and you could put the sticker wherever you wanted it to. And everybody said, "We're getting we're a long way off." <laughs> yes, we'll reach AGI, but we're a long way off. So that was encouraging to me because uh, that means. People realize that what we have today is AGI is not around the corner, and I think it, it, the hype cycle prints uh, uh, promotes it like it's around the corner, and it's not. So, all right, uh, that's it. Does anybody have any questions before I sign off? We need to figure out what general intelligence even means. I I have a I have a good idea what it means. In my my definition of intelligence is. Um, um, the ability to move through reality, move through your environment, and give and given the feedback of sensory information, understand how your actions affect the environment. Um, capsule was was it in the air there? Oh, capsules. One person asked me about capsules. Nobody talked about capsules, and the only reason he talked about capsules is because I was talking to him about uh, locations. And, and 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 sensory motor and and object modeling and he said is that anything like Hinton's capsules and I'm like eh, yeah it's <laughs> and then so I uh, referred him to our YouTube channel with our current research meetings where we were talking all about Hinton's capsules but um, but not a topic not a technical topic in any of the talks that I went to or any of the conversation that I heard so um, yeah but I, yeah Hinton is Hinton's a genius, man. So it's hard hard to put it any other way. Uh, he's he's certainly really ahead of the curve. Um, oh, so Intrepid Fox saw the Monday meeting about capsules. Cool. Um, I'm glad that was that was pretty interesting. I'm really happy to see us like uh, sort of reviving the, those things. And 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 I heard Jeff say several times, man, I wish we I wish we would have cited him because he hadn't read those papers. And after after like uh, Marcus gave a recap of all these papers, Jeff was really impressed. He was like, "This is," he was like, "This is." He was happy because it gives us an indication that you know we're on the right track. If if this is what Hinton has said 
such a long time ago. Um, it feels like well, if we're coming, we're coming to the same conclusions independently. That's a that's a good thing, right? That's a really good thing. That that's an indicator that we're doing the right thing. So I'm happy about that because our goal is is figuring out intelligence, right? Um, great. Well, I'm I'm glad you did. And if you haven't, in, Intrepid Fox, go to the forum and and uh, uh, register register there. Um, let me know. You send me a PM or something. Let me know you came from Twitch. I would appreciate it. Uh, yeah, capsules are all about hierarchy, but there's some things that we can, I think, uh, take away from it, uh, even without the hierarchy bit. Um, so, all right. Any, anything else? I'm going to go get some Pakistani food <laughs> Not while I'm in the city. <laughs> Got to go get something ethnic. And I saw one right down the street. That's my plan. I get some rest. I got another day tomorrow, but I'm not going to stream tomorrow uh, because as soon as the conference is over, I'm going to drive home. <clears throat> I think well, well, the way the way Hinton puts it is the capsule is the same level as a mini column, or at least he uh, makes that comparison. The capsule as, as like a mini column. I'm not sure how correct that is. But. <clears throat> All right, you guys. I'm going to head out. Thanks thanks for watching. Dub, 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 dude. Uh, appreciate the time. No problem. I'm, I'm happy to do it as long as I got uh, viewers that are interested. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, go ask questions on the forum. I'll check them out later. Take care. So I'm stopping the stream. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, Monday. Oh, by the way, Monday. We're going to do active duty cycles, uh, spatial pooling, active duty cycles. It's going to be cool. I, there, I have some good visualizations in store for Monday. All right? All right, take care.